As I've said before many times, we study microsurgical anatomy to make what is a delicate, faithful, awesome experience for our patient more accurate, gentle, and safe. Uh, we want to talk about preserving the frontalis muscle, which if lost can cause a significant cosmetic deficit. The reason that I became interested in this project is that at many courses uh, for trainees, uh, there was considerable confusion about how we go about each step along the way of preserving the frontalis muscle when we return a frontotemporal flap. One of the techniques that is used is called interfascial, but that technique deals only with a part of the exposure over the temporalis muscle, which we describe as interfascial, while to really save those nerves along their full course, we have to think not only interfascial exposure over the temporalis muscle, but we need to think about extending that exposure subparacranial medial to the superior temporal line. So we need to think about the approach to preserving the branches of the facial nerve to the frontalis muscle in the area lateral to the superior temporal line where the exposure is interfascial between the superficial and deep layers of temporal fascia but we need to think about medial to the superior temporal line where the, the exposure is subparacranial. And then we need to think about uh, maintaining the integrity of the nerves across the superior temporal line as a part of preserving the frontalis muscle. The other uh, commonly used exposure to preserve the nerves to the frontalis muscle is called subfascial exposure. But again, subfascial deals only with the exposure over the temporalis muscle and doesn't fully explain the technique that also has to be subparacranial with maintenance of the contu continuity of the nerves across the superior temporal line. So the frontalis muscle we see here is embedded in the galea. Uh, and it's supplied by the temporal branches of the facial nerve, which if you look at various literature, are described as frontal, temporal, frontotemporal, temporal, frontal nerves. We call them, we refer to them, uh, as in some of the papers in the neurosurgical literature, as temporal nerves. And those nerves cross the temporalis fascia and then uh, supply the frontalis muscle that is innervated uh, by these branches of the facial nerve that enter the muscle usually within two centimeters above the superior orbital rim. And then the nerve supply spreads posteriorly in the muscle. So if for some reason, an incision extends across the mid part of the muscle, then the innervation to the upper part of the muscle is going to be lost. So the two approaches that we want to talk about, we term interfascial subparacranial and subfascial subparacranial. Um, 
And in looking at this, we want to preserve the nerve all the way from the stylomastoid foramen, where in the parotid gland, it gives rise to usually three branches to the frontalis and the orbicularis oculi. Usually there are three branches, three temporal branches crossing the zygomatic arch. By the time they reach the frontalis muscle, they've split up into five branches at least that are uh, very tiny, almost imperceptible and difficult to see even with a surgical microscope. So if you look here in front of the tragus, as these nerves cross the zygomatic arch, there are commonly three temporal branches. The most posterior one goes predominantly to the auricularis, a muscle embedded in the galea above the ear. And here we see the supraorbital area, and here we have temporal fascia laterally, and then at the superior temporal line, the branches run on the outer surface of the pericranium here, and then pass under the lateral edge of the frontalis muscle, and then spread posteriorly. On the surface of the muscle, on the superficial side, you see the superorbital branches of V1, uh, branches of the frontal nerve, so that to preserve the nerve supply to the frontalis muscle, we need to preserve it on the outer surface of the temporal fascia, and then as it crosses the superior temporal line, and then medially on the outer surface of the pericranium, where it dives under the lateral edge of the frontalis muscle. Here we've uh, done an exposure both lateral to the superior temporal line and medial. We've opened a window here in the superficial layer of temporal fascia and we see deep to the superficial layer of temporal fascia, the interfascial fat pad, and then deep to it, the deep temporal fascia on the outer surface of the muscle. And then the nerves cross the superior temporal line where both the superficial and deep layers of temporal fascia are attached to the line and then we've opened a window in the pericranium that is deep to these fine filaments of uh, temporal nerves that pass to the muscle. And we've removed the pericranium and we see these branches then passing under the lateral side of the muscle. So to preserve the branches from stylomastoid foramen to the frontalis muscle, uh, we must preserve not only in the area of the temporal fascia lateral to the superior temporal line, but also medial to the superior temporal line where the dissection is subparacranial. And I emphasize that because a number of the papers describing the technique describe only the subfascial or the interfascial part of the procedure, and then no mention is made of the nerves crossing the superior temporal line or crossing the outer surface of the pericranium. And the key to preserving these nerves is not opening the layers between which they are sandwiched. Uh, so that now we take a look uh, at the layers here. Now, lateral to the superior temporal line, 
once we get to the interfascial fat pad, we've turned up galia. This is subgalial. And then the next layer is lucerealer tissue through which the nerves pass. And then lateral to the superior temporal line, the first layer is superficial layer of temporal fascia. And then that's the interfascial fat pad. And then the next layer is, that's the deep fascia. And then the next layer is the temporal muscle. And the last layer is, well, it's pericranium, or you can call it periosteum. It's attached to the muscle on the deep surface. We call it peris, periosteum to differentiate it from this layer medial to the superior temporal line that we call pericranial. So we call one approach interfascial subparacranial, and Yasser Gel gave us the interfascial approach. The other approach is subfascial subparacranial, and the, the subfascial approach, that term was coined at the barrel, and one of the early papers on that was with Spetzler. So there are five layers lateral, uh, one layer medial, and then we start the dissection subgalial, and then uh, and up in this higher part of the flap, the dissection is between the galia and the temporalis fascia laterally and the pericranium medially. And that dissection is through the loose areolar issue. But once we reach the upper margin of the fat pad, then we want to stay out of that loose areolar layer between the temporalis fascia and pericranium, not open that layer. So we go interfascial or subfascial lateral to the superior temporal line and then subparacranial medial to the line. Uh, here we see the five layers lateral to the superior temporal line and the single paracranial layer medial, and we want to stay out of the loose areolar tissue between the temporal fascia and paracranium and the galia then more superficially. Once we do the interfascial approach, I've noticed that courses that there's a tendency of trainees to want to make a cut through this layer right at the superior temporal line so you can free up the temporalis muscle. But if there's a cut through these layers at the line, then commonly the nerves are cut before they cross the pericranium to reach the uh, frontalis muscle. So that instead of cutting vertically along the superior temporal line, we want to make a cut here that this cut is at the level deep to the superficial layer of temporal fascia and the fat pad, and it leaves the superficial layer of temporal fascia connected to the pericranium. We don't want to separate those two layers. We do an incision then deep to the interfascial fat pad to connect it, and that cut or the dissection is parallel to the outer surface of the skull but there's a tendency once the interfascial is completed that I've seen at courses where they want to make a cut through these layers at the superior temporal line to fold the muscle. So 
You want to leave the superficial layer of fascia intact with a frontal prayer cranium. You don't want to cut into this area, but still to turn the flap forward, you have to separate the temporal fascia and the attachment of the pericranium across the superior temporal line with a cut that's roughly parallel to the surface of the skull. So here's what it looks like. Uh, we've elevated a interfascial subparacranial flap, maintaining the continuity of the temporal fascia and the pericranium across the superior temporal line. And now we can fold the temporalis muscle in any direction that we want to. Now, this is the way we usually complete the interfascial subparacranial approach. We start lateral to the superior temporal line, elevating galia from temporal fascia, and then medially to the superior temporal line we leave the pericranium attached to the undersurface of the galea so we don't enter that loose areolar tissue medially in the upper part of the flap. But as we elevate the flap then uh, here at the upper edge of the interfascial fat pad we go interfascial uh, lateral to the superior temporal line and subparacranial medial so that we don't enter the lucerealer layer with the nerves in it, the lucerealer layer located between the superficial layer of temporal fascia and the galea. And often at courses again I see individuals not wanting to cut down and separate the superficial fascia from the pericranium and it's in that layer here of lucerealer tissue that the nerves are right. So as you fold the flap forward you want to maintain this continuity and use a cut parallel to the surface of the uh, skull separating the superficial layer of temporal fascia and pericranium from the superior temporal line. Unless you separate that, you can't fold the flap forward. And so you don't want to do a cut that separates superficial temporal fascia from pericranium. You want to undercut it along the line and maintain the continuity across these layers. The nerves are on the outer surface. And here's the uh, interfascial subparacranial flap. And you can fold the muscle in any direction. Uh, now the other approach is at the upper margin of the exposure laterally to go under the temporalis fascia, between the temporalis fascia and the temporalis muscle, we call this subfascial approach. And then we keep that temporalis fascia in continuity with the pericranium by elevating pericranium starting at the upper margin of the exposure. And here we've just opened the deep layer of temporal fascia to just take a look at the interfascial uh, fat pad here between the superficial and deep layer of temporal fascia. Uh, but then uh, in each of these approaches, after we've elevated the temporalis fascia here, subfascial and the pericranium, maintaining their continuity across the superior temporal line, we then leave a musculofascial cuff along the line uh, 
to use in closing the temporalis muscle laterally. One reason that we describe this is that there are excellent descriptions of the lateral part of the approach over the temporalis uh, muscle, but there's really minimal reflection of or discussion of preserving the nerves once you do the subfascial or interfascial approach, maintaining the continuity of the nerves across the superior temporal line and then on the outer surface of the pericranium. And here we just see the cut that we use in the subfascial subparacranial along the superior temporal line that we don't want to cut through the connection between the temporal fascia and pericranium that will cut the nerves, but we maintain the continuity of the superficial and deep layer of temporal fascia with the pericranium using this cut deep to these layers that separates it, the flap from the superior temporal line so it can be folded forward. The superficial temporal artery usually runs in the subcutaneous tissue superficial to the galea so that commonly we don't see that artery in a frontotemporal flap unless we're going to harvest it for a bypass. The, we see the bifurcation, it can be above the zygomatic arch at the level or below, but if the bifurcation is above the arch, usually the temporal branches pass forward below the frontal branch of the superficial temporal artery, but if the bifurcation is low, you may see the nerves intertwined or just deep to the branches of the superficial temporal artery.